Let's uh, just open with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can think about Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that it is all about himself. And so, Lord, we ask as we open your word that you may speak to us today. Lord, we pray that we may open our hearts and our ears to, to receive something from yourself. Amen. So we've been looking at uh, 1 John, the, gospel, the letters of 1 John. We're up to uh, the second chapter. We always need to remind ourselves as to why the person who wrote the, the words, why he wrote those. And so if you put the first slide up for us, Joel, let's read uh, in 1 John chapter 1. Why John says that he wrote these letters, these words. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, reason one, and truly our fellowship is with Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, reason two. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Three reasons why John has written those, these words. So we need to keep these in our mind. It's very easy sometimes to take a letter like John and to look at its content and to isolate it and not connect it with the real reason. Because there's so much in it, it's easy to be able to do that. But we want to keep in mind, as I say, why he wrote it. What did John write for, want from his readers? And we've just read those three points, haven't we? That that's what he wanted his readers to do. But is it just for John's readers at that time? Or is it for us today? There's some things in the scriptures that they're written to us, but they're not necessarily for us. As a good example, or a basic example, we don't do sacrifices today. But we can learn so much from the sacrificial system. So they're not for us. We don't carry those scriptures out today. They're for somebody else. Well, we have to ask us, is what John's written, is it for us today? Is it for me to put into practice into my life? Do we have to deal with the same issues as the readers of John? Do we have the same things going in, in our life as what the readers had? And we will find out as we go through, well, yes, we have. We have exactly the same things going on in our life as the people that John wrote to. So it's an important letter. It's important writing that we can take note of and we can apply to our lives. John's gospel is how you get fellowship with God. It's how you get to be born again. It's how to be, become a new creation. It's how to accept Jesus as your own personal saviour. That's John's gospel. But John writes in his letter of how you should continue in that fellowship. How that fellowship should go on and progress from once you've taken that decision to take Jesus as your own personal saviour. To accept his free gift of salvation John's letter goes on from that. The problem is we can affect our fellowship with people and with God. We cannot affect our salvation. Once we're born again, you can't be born again and born again and born again. It's born again once, security never be taken away from you. You're saved once, never to be saved again. You have new life once, never to have new life again. It's once and secure. But you can alter your fellowship with God. You can alter your fellowship with other people. And so there are things in your life that you can do and things in your life that you don't do that affect your fellowship. So what are they? 
See, God says fellowship requires us to walk and stay in the light. We, if you look at John's Gospel, if we look at the, he talks about walking in the light. John talks about walking in the light in his letter. So how do you do that? What does that look like in your daily life, walking in the light? It says God is light and in him is no darkness at all in the first chapter, verse 5. So if there's no darkness in God and it's all pure light, how do we put that into action in our daily lives? Well, in chapter 2, we have uh, three themes that come out in the first two chapters. So the fellowship that we have with God requires us to deal with sin in our lives. The fellowship requires us to keep Jesus' commandments. And the fellowship requires us to deal with false teachings. If we deal with all these, the joy that we have in Christ and the Father will be full. It means it's going to be complete. Once it's full, you can't put any more in it. If you've got a glass of water and you fill it to the top, well, you can't put any more in it. It's just going to go over the side. So it's complete. So if you follow these things, if you do these things, as John is going to tell us, then your joy that you have, your life in Christ, is going to be full. It's going to be complete. You can't give, put any more into it. Unfortunately, my life... I'm that far away from a big glass. You know, it's nowhere near complete because, as most of us, you'll find that I'm a sinner too. I do wrong. I'm not as good as what I think I am. I disobey God. So, what do I do? Do I give up? No. You keep persevering, don't you? You keep going. Because, as we will find out, God has an answer for that too. Each Christian, yourself and me, will struggle with these three things. We all struggle in life. Why? Because we're just sinners. We are just disobedient to the God who created us. That's life. Because we have this flesh and it doesn't want to know God. We have to take effort... We have to take work and we have to take time in our life to be able to do these three things. But God expects it of us. God doesn't do it for us. God doesn't say, we shake uh, a magic wand and so and go, there you are, it's all done for you. It's in our hands. The ball is in our court to be able to, to do these things. God expects us to put the time and the effort in to be able to do them. But we need to be careful, as I said, with John's letter, that we don't isolate it from his gospel. The format the, that John uses to write is a man like me. He does it like I like. Just pretty basic, down to the point, no airs and graces, says it as it is, but you also find that his style is not like Paul's. Paul's style, when he's writing, is very theological. It has a process that Paul goes through to explain things. John doesn't. John's writing is all over the place. He goes from one subject to another and back to the same subject and then on to something else. And there he goes over here and over there. So you have to try and put it all together. So, this is what I did. If you, this is for your homework. I always like to give you homework. But this is your homework. Copy out John's, John's letter. Okay? And every time that you see a theme, what I did, I took these three themes and I highlighted in a different colour what John had written about that. And you'll be surprised as to when you see it, the different colours of where they are, because there's no pattern. But you'll see where they all fit in, and you'll see where John goes 
from a theme and then something else and then goes back to it. So it's quite interesting. We looked at the fact of, when we did an overview, we looked at the fact of the, the Gnostics. John wrote his letter in regards to the Gnostics of the day and the false teachings that were around at that time. So, these are what the Gnostics say. This is what they believe. We can sin all we like. Why? Because the Gnostics say that there is the physical, which is evil, and the spiritual, which is perfect. And because we're evil, we're going to do wrong. And therefore, it doesn't matter if you sin. You can sin as much as you want. So, when we're looking at this letter and what John says, just see where John answers this belief of the Gnostics. The Gnostics say Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Is only a spirit. It's only a spirit in a human that has come down to teach people the knowledge of what God, of their God wants to say. So Jesus isn't the Son of God. So if Jesus isn't the Son of God, you don't have to follow his commands. You don't have to do what he says. You don't have to walk in the way that Jesus wants you to walk. You don't have to listen to Jesus, apart from the knowledge that he gives you. The Gnostics will say that they are the truth. But John answers that as well. So John, as you're going through now, you just look back on those things and see how John answers those beliefs that, is, that the Gnostics say. But in our life, it's because of Jesus, who Jesus is, we have to do these things. Okay, it's because of who Jesus is and what he did that we have to walk and we have to stay in the light. But how do we do that as we've looked? Okay, the fellowship desires or requires that we deal with sin in our lives. So I've did mine in green. So it says, I've picked out the, the scriptures that uh, we have here. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world and then in verse 12 he says I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake verse 15 he says love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. It says here that we have an advocate with the Father. We have a defence lawyer. So if you go into court you will have a defence lawyer that defends you to say that you're innocent. The problem that we have is that we know that we're guilty. And Jesus comes along and he says, Dave Newell, he's guilty. And I go, yes, I know I'm guilty because I'm a sinner, done wrong. But Jesus comes before us, but also he has, it says here, he has propitiation for our sins. Just one of those long church words that we like to use, that the church has its own language. Have you, know, have you never noticed that? The church has its own language. It's like trying to learn a new language, isn't it, when you go into church? Just great if we can just really uh, just use everyday language, but we don't because we gain this, this church language stuff. But anyway, propitiation is one of those words. 
But what it means, it just means that you want to gain somebody's favour. If you lose to look at paganism and all God's that false idols and stuff, they would have to take a sacrifice to appease the God. To you take that sacrifice that we looked at Jeremiah, it even went down to killing your children. Take your child, to kill your child, so that you would make that false God happy. And that's what propitiation is. It's the fact that you are you want to appease or you want to please God. And so, my advocate is Jesus because he died for me. Because he paid, he's my defence lawyer to say, Dave's done wrong, but Jesus then comes in propitiation. He comes as my, gaining my favour, and he says, I've paid the price. I've paid for Dave Newell's salvation. I've paid for Dave Newell's eternal life. Therefore, God says, Smacks the gravel down and goes, Dave, off you go. Jesus has paid it. But once he's paid it, he's paid. Can never lose that. Can never go back on it. I'm never going to lose my salvation or my eternal life. Because it's not in my hands. It's not to do with my work. It's nothing I can do. It's all to do with the work that Jesus did. And Jesus isn't going to let me down. Jesus isn't going to fail. Jesus isn't going to drop it. It's all done by Jesus himself. Jesus says, this also it says, our sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake, for his sake. It's not for my sake that my sins are forgiven. It's nothing to do, I don't benefit from it apart from the fact that I have a relationship with God. It's not for my sake that my sins are forgiven. What does it say here? Therefore, Jesus' sake. It's for Jesus who forgave my sins. It's for him. He is the one who's forgiven me. Forgiveness is to do with the person who is forgiving. It's for Jesus' sake that I'm forgiven. And I'm so thankful that I am. Because without it, I would not have a relationship with God. It says here, love not the world. All these issues here and these points you could do one week at a time. But we're trying to fit them all in to what's said. You will find also, as we go through the letter, that John will open these things up also into the future. So sin here, he just opens it, opens it up. And then, John, you will see as, we, as the weeks go by that uh, the issue or the theme of sin opens up and he goes into a bit, excuse me, he goes into a bit more depth into it. But he gives us three things, doesn't he, as to uh, not loving the world. And the view is to go back, we can go really go back into it, is he goes back into Adam and Eve and look in the garden and where Eve was tempted and she fell and she sinned. You would look at those three things come into place. And you will see that also every temptation and every sin that you do falls into one of these three categories. So as you're going through sinning in the day, you can go, which one was that? And then see where you fail. It says, though, all these are not of the Father. And this is really where John speaks pretty bluntly. Because it says, if any man love the world, the love of God, the love of the Father, is not in him. Just take that in. All these things of sin, all these things of the world, all that the world has to offer is not of God. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's no grey areas, is there, when John's speaking? It's black or white. It's light or darkness. In God, there is no darkness. There's no grey area. It's one or the other. In my life, and I'm sure as you, in yours, you find it very difficult to have one or the other. We like to sit somewhere in that grey area. But it isn't the case. 
when God speaks about our lives. You only have to look at the corruption that's in the world to see how serious a matter that God takes these things. Fellowship requires us to keep Jesus' commandments. John again is quite straightforward in what he says. Now I'm not going to read all this one for time. There's what the fellowship, the, the, the Jesus' commandments on these is quite a, a big amount on this uh, chapter two. So just let me nip through one or two uh, points that Jesus says. If we do not follow Jesus' commandments, then we are liars and the truth is not in us. If we do, then the love of God is in us. If we do not follow Jesus' commandments, we are liars. Because Jesus says, you've been born again, you're a new creation. I've made you anew. I've given you new life. How can you now go and walk in darkness with that new life? You can't. You have to walk in the light. You have to have. You've given Jesus his life. So you can't walk in darkness anymore. You can't walk in the world's ways. You can't walk in the ways that you used to walk. You can't walk in sin anymore. It's light or darkness black and white well Jesus says in, well John says here a new commandment is love your brother Jesus says in John 13 34 a new commandment love one another as I have loved you the old is the Torah and if you were to look in Levit Leviticus 19 and verse 18 it says love your neighbour as yourself and you know yourself, don't you, that your neighbour is everybody around you. But, John goes one further. But why does he go one further? Because Jesus has shown us more love. Jesus has up the game, is up the bar to a higher level and to a higher standard than what the Torah and the Old Testament said. No longer is it just your neighbour, it's now your brother. It's now the people who are your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now you're expected to be up in the game of your love just as God and Jesus loves you. Ask yourself, is that easy? No. But, if you have hate, in your heart it screws you up it takes your insides and it grabs hold of you and it twists them and it screws your life up because you have no peace but it has to be dealt with because God doesn't want you to be that way and so, we have to deal with, with love for our brothers and sisters, don't we? The problem with the church is we're all sinners. We're not perfect people. So it's very difficult. We rub each other up. We all have our own personality, our own characteristics. We all have our own background that have affected our lives. So, as Jesus says, he expects us to work at it and put the time in and the effort to carry out these things, to carry out Jesus' commandments that he says that we need to love one another. We are to abide in Christ, he says in verse 24, and the unction or the anointing that we've got is given to us to be able to do these things. We have the power, the Holy Spirit helps us and enables us to be able to do these things. You're not on your own that God gives you these things to do. 
The fellowship also requires that we deal with false teaching. It's quite easy to know when somebody's giving false teaching because, one, they deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny the Father and the Son. You only have to look at so many religions today who only see Jesus as being a prophet, as Jesus has been a good person, as Jesus has, Jesus has been only a teacher, as Jesus has not been quite the Son of God. How many religions will do that? Yet, you will also find false teaching in the church as well. Satan will go out to present the word of God as closely as possible because is that not what fake is? You copy something that is original and you make it as close as you can. Well, it's fake, isn't it? Can you tell the difference? How do you know the difference between what is fake and what is not? How do you know what I am saying is true? How are you going to test it? How do you know if you sit under somebody's teaching what they're saying is true? You need to go out and you need to look it up in the scriptures for yourself. You need to read it in the scriptures for yourself. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and to show you. What does the scripture say? Ask for wisdom and God will give you wisdom. Ask for understanding and God will give you understanding. Don't take my word for what I'm saying. I think I've done the best that I can do. I think I have, what God has revealed for me today, I think I'm doing the best to bring it to yourself. Everybody who does false teaching will say the same. They don't come to you and go in, I'm a false teacher. I'm going to try and take you down. I'm going to try and take you off the road. They will all say they have the truth. Just as I can stand up here and say, I am doing my best. But you have to go and take my words and apply them and look at yourself and look at the scriptures for yourself to see if what I am saying weighs up to what God is saying in the scriptures. And if they're not, come and tell me. Come and say to me, Dave, I think on this point you might be slightly wrong. You might be come and say, Dave, on this point you're totally wrong. But you have to do your own homework. You have to put the time and the effort and to work in that's what Jesus says. It's the balls in your court, not in my court. I'm telling you what I think and I believe God is saying through these scriptures, but you have to test them out for yourself. The fellowship with God, nobody can take it away from you, the fact that you have that fellowship with God. But you are in a position yourself to be able to affect it. Whether you have a close relationship or you don't. Whether your relationship is far away. And this is what John is setting before us. That it's in your court, the ball's in your court, to have that close fellowship or not. So, that pretty much covers the second chapter. So if you need any, any information on that, just let me know and I will uh, I'll tell you where my, uh, my, my colours were if you want. So there you go. Well, let's just uh, close in a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us everything we need to know about having a relationship with yourself. The problem is that you put it in our, uh, in our hands to be able to do that. But we ask, Lord, that as we look at the scriptures, that we may want want to apply and we have, have the desire to apply them to our lives 
So, Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you for the fact that we've been able to uh, remember yourself this morning. And we pray that we may take that, the fact that our salvation, we are indebted to you to it, but we also thank you that it's a free gift. And so, Lord, we, as we go through this week, we just pray that you may, as you shed the light into our feet, that we may be willing to follow. Amen.